In the Shadow of Mount Sinai by Peter Sloterdijk Translated by Wieland Hoban Section 2 On the Genesis of Peoples in General There is surely still a consensus in the science of religion that early religious cult systems, whatever else they might be, can be viewed in their primary manner of effect as ethnoplastic systems of rules. By imposing shared narratives, rituals, and norms on a collective, they mold the practicing collectives into carriers, into the subject-object, philosophically speaking, of those same conceptions and procedures. Thus, the phenomenon of religion, bracket in the era before its individualistic differentiation in modernity, at least, close bracket, seems initially to be tied entirely to the time-honored functions of group synthesis. The biological reproduction of a, quote, culture, or ethnic collective, is necessarily accompanied by the passing on of the group-specific system of symbols and rituals. The fact that these simple observations lead to non-trivial consequences can be clarified by the following reflections. It is no coincidence that ethnologists, anthropologists, and theologians have been claiming for some time that no indications have been found anywhere in the world pointing to the existence of completely, quote, irreligious peoples. And how could they, when the phenomenon of peoples as such is engendered only by the collective integrative effects of shared rites and histories, conventionally known as, quote, religions? The assumption of a people existing completely without religion would amount to the paradoxical assertion that there can be stabilized collectives which dispense with all connecting media and do not become acquainted with any symbolic bond, shared history, or firm normative commitments. This would mean virtually postulating a people devoid of content, and thus more a random crowd than a physically and spiritually self-reproducing unit. For the same reason, a people, in any meaningful sense of the word, thus cannot exist without its language, provided one understands language not merely as a vehicle for everyday communication, but also, and most importantly, as a medium for imprinting the most culturally important subjects on the consciousness of its speakers. From this perspective, language is primarily the organ of relevance. Humans can only claim to speak a language properly once they can say in it what is vital for life. Naturally, this highest level of relevance always includes local ideas about the collective's conditions of survival and salvation. Thoughts about this are not exchanged in passing under the palaver tree or the well, but are always etched in the memories of the collective's members in moments of terrible seriousness, often in emotional stress situations resulting from bloody sacrificial acts. In the history of cultures so far, the establishment of the highest ranking motifs of relevance has often been connected to procedures enforcing a pedagogy of pain and suffering. There is no need to expand on why, among the notions significant for salvation and survival that are passed on through language and rights within the internal space of an ethnicity, it is the instructions for preserving differences of status that are almost always playing the most outstanding part. In early folk religions, making leadership positions imposing was one of the sources of the sacred. To ensure hierarchical control over the collective, most early peoples cloaked the chief and leader roles, and later the royal ranks, with an aura of sacred import, and bestowed upon them the power to determine the life or death of their own people, as well as strangers. One can generally observe that the preferred activity of early religions was concerning themselves with the sacralization of leadership. In addition, they focused on the symbolic aggrandizement and cultic securing of protective spaces, burial sites, and important foodstuffs. Related thoughts manifest themselves in Johann Gottfried Herder's suggestive remark that, quote, among the most uncultivated people, the language of religion is ever the most ancient and obscure, close quote. The increasing opacity of older religious languages is substantially due to the fact that, in the course of the civilization process, some gestures and turns of phrase are forgotten that were previously required in order to commit the collective to its own inner cohesion and ideas of sacred relevance. Such figures are later carried along erratically by the current of sacred traditions as petrified relics of an obsolete self-constraint, 
As one can observe from the 17th century on in Europe, modernizing cultures subject themselves to an accelerated change in the forms of self-constraint, bracket, especially following the replacement of the sacred victim constraint by secular institutions such as the constraints of schooling and taxation, close bracket, with the inevitable result that participants in modern social games no longer perceive earlier methods of alignment merely as a venerable relics, but increasingly as dark embarrassments. With these stenographic intimations of early ethnogenesis through intra-ethnic narratives, rites, and salvific notions, I am attempting to explain plausibly why, and using what concepts, the recent science of, quote, ethnology was able to move beyond Platonizing views of ethnic archetypes and beyond romantic ideas relating to the, quote, spirits of peoples. However generously Herder's ethnological ecumenism was conceived, with all ethnicities of the world, their confused literature about gods and their sonorous folk songs considered colors in the prism of an absolute creativity. It remained problematic in its essentialist view of peoples as spiritual cultural substances that emanated, no one knows how, from the transcendent productivity of the world's creator. Once peoples have entered existence, however primitive they might be, they can, in the further course of their development, follow the routines of generational shift that, in the triad of theme, variation, and reflection, produce cultural convention. Thus, Herder, following his own premises, not only very rightly raised the question, quote, whence is the religion of these people derived, can these poor creatures have invented their religious worship as a sort of natural theology, close quote, he could also answer it using an onboard, that is to say, imminent and cultural historical means. Quote, Absorbed in labor, they invent nothing, but in all things follow the traditions of their forefathers. Close quote. Quote, Here, therefore, tradition has been the propagator of their religion and sacred rites, as of their language and slight degree of civilization. Close quote. For Herder, too, then, the enigma of religion lies not so much in its horizontal transmission through the stream of generations. Rather, it conceals itself in the unobservable, almost vertical beginning of ethnogenesis. Herder makes no secret of his view that all peoples, even the materially poorest and culturally least developed, must be understood as genuine ideas of God. In their own respective ways, they all hear the grand melody. It is therefore no surprise that these actually existing ideas have reflected upon themselves since time immemorial. Where there is a people, there is always also the crystallization nucleus of a religion. And where there is religion, the embodiment of the creating divine is implied by a special language-based ethnic manifestation. Because, from the perspective of this over-eager cultural theology, peoples per se carry divine sparks inside themselves, it is in their nature to speak as theopoetic collectives. In doing so, they manifest themselves as wildly varying degrees of explicitness as local carriers of a potentially generalizable idea of God. It should be clear that, with this generous interpretation of global ethnic diversity, the Weimar consistorial counselor Herder was following on, consciously or unconsciously, from the theology of Pentecost. At the same time, as a child of the Enlightenment and a partisan of the French Revolution, he disconnects the remarkable incident on the 50th day after the Jesuit Passover from the original scene in Jerusalem and stretches it geographically and historically into a worldwide, ever-repeating event. From an idea-historical perspective, Herder's theory of peoples is typical of his time, a synthesis of the Christian doctrine of spirit and the extra-Christian theory of genius. As individual brilliance manifests itself in works of art, the brilliance of peoples manifests itself in religions. It was in the nature of the topic that Herder's enthusiastic interpretation of ethnic pluralism could not be the last word on the matter. Anyone who speaks of a, quote, people, Eo Ipso speaks of, quote, peoples, and whoever speaks of, quote, peoples cannot avoid asking what are the principles of its continued existence, which also means the mechanisms of its separation, its multiplication, its decline, its interdependence, and its mixture. 
This and nothing else is the aim of the discipline that in the late 19th century was given the name, quote, ethnology, and since the early 20th has been known as, quote, cultural anthropology. Its task is to study ethnogenetic processes in the light of secular premises. It goes without saying that this entails the abandonment of popular concepts based on essentialist or even metaphysical foundations. This brings the mythopoetic and theopoetic talents of peoples to light all the more clearly. The matter itself and the mental disquiet accompanying it go back to antiquity. Humanity did not need to await the appearance of cultural anthropologists in order to become aware of the facts of religious and ethnic pluralism. Just how old the beleaguered awareness of the existence of a multi-ethnic problem really is, is demonstrated by, among other things, the myth of the Tower of Babel. The authors of this equally brief and momentous tale, bracket, which, according to current research, was inserted into the Book of Genesis in the Pentateuch in post-exilic times, meaning at the dawn of the 6th century, close bracket, made it easier for themselves to access the problematic issue by placing the bold assumption of a monolingual humanity at the start. The editors of the Tower Myth, priests returning to Palestine from Babylon who saw no reason to hide their anti-imperial affect, simply equated monolinguality with unanimity and unanimity with despicable arrogance. From the clerical perspective, arrogance leads directly to self-deification. In the architectural dialect, this results in the decision to erect a tower reaching to heaven. It is no surprise that this displeases a Jewish god from Sinai, here already dated back to prehistory. In his wrath, he shatters the languages of the builders, thus causing them to scatter in all directions, until finally, for better or worse, 72 peoples with as many languages and cults settle on the earth, sufficiently far apart and deeply, deeply inwardly estranged from one another. The nuisance of ethnic plurality is attributed to the preventative punishment of the arrogance that manifests itself in buildings of urbane magnificence. From the era of early empire formations, if not even earlier, the awareness of the simultaneous existence of many peoples already articulated succinctly in ancient times took on a high degree of religio-political virulence. Indeed, the thinkers among early peoples did not fail to recognize the connection between the existence of ethnic groupings and securing them through religious cults. Nonetheless, the ancient world did not yet have ecumenical forms to discuss the rivalry and coexistence of the gods, let alone any ethnological overviews of converging and diverging variants of cults devoted to higher beings, to say nothing of the touristic and academic neutralization of differences between peoples and myths, which did not spread outwards from Europe until the 18th century. In the era of increasingly nervous encounters between peoples in the 2nd and 1st millennia BC, there were various attempts to come to terms with the irreducible pluralism of ethnicities and their religioid control systems. At a general level, one can divide these attempts into two opposing blocks of neighborhood policies. On the one side are syncretistic tendencies whose goal is a liberating amalgamation of foreign worlds of peoples and gods. Unifying tendencies of this kind are typical of political theologies, such as those attempted in the integration of several ethnicities into an empire and a corresponding higher-level sacred imperial order. In the process, priests of a local cult are retained as diplomats who can recognize their own gods under the foreign names they bear in other popular cults. The great innovation of this school of thought lies in the discovery that, with interculturally sustainable gods, the inner and outer converge. What one had taken for a foreign god is revealed, upon closer inspection, as a different guise of one's own deity. Peoples and cults approach one another as soon as they understand that they have devoted themselves to the same numinous entity under different names. The ecumenically compatible thought model of the one in the many spread among the educated, and the number one became the keyword in educated synthesis. Thus, imperial theology whether Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Hellenistic, or Roman, emerged as the field in which the traditional distinction between domestic and foreign policy faded. 
that translations between the cults were usually supported by the monarchs and priesthoods of trans-ethnic state constructions is a result of their unmistaken interest in synthetic concepts and ecumenical solutions. A completely different interpretation of the polyethnic and multicultic situation can be observed in the second block. Here, the leading actors respond to the perception of polyethnic existence with a resolute hardening and aggrandizement of their own cult traditions. This tendency to withdraw to what is their own culminates in the refusal to let oneself be compared and to participate in translations. Hence, the alternative way out of the inevitable ethnic and cultic comparisons invites an escape to singularity. Anyone recommending this strategy for self-preservation amid intercultic competition to a people must also offer the prospect of a greater contest. Because our god is like no other, our people too will be like no other. Whoever commits to the untranslatable god, the most exclusive of divinities, will be rewarded with endless procreative successes and offspring with long memories. Whoever does not join the confessional community may go under amid the multiplicity, leaving neither traces nor memories behind. Biblically put, their name will be struck from the Book of Life. It is surely unnecessary to emphasize that the second of these paths was the option of Israel, when it decided against the danger of confusion allegedly posed first by living among the Egyptians, then by the encounters with Near Eastern peoples who followed different cults. The often discussed ban on images, which rules out cultic depictions of the Jewish God, initially testifies not so much to the theological depth of a new concept of God as to the ingenuous realization that the most reliable way to stay free of the confusing cult competition is the consistent non-depiction of one's own God. In his non-manifestation, the leaders of the Jewish people found a remarkable and unique selling point that ensured incomparability through invisibility. Whether this concept was influenced by Egyptian models or not was of no consequence for its success. The resulting theological problem, namely the incompatibility of the image ban with the epiphanic imperative, that is, the obligation of any god with worldly competence to appear, was taken on board by the creators of the Jewish religion. At this point in our reflections, it requires no great effort to explain why the term, quote, monotheism does not contribute very much to an understanding of the process. The religious leaders of Israel, from Moses and Joshua to the temple priests of the post-exilic period, were not concerned with theologically charging the numerical word, quote, one. This would become a concern only much later on in the Platonizing speculations about the monad. The covenant was the form of a non-mixing contract and a non-translation oath, combined with the highest salvific guarantees. Whoever mixes themselves is eliminated, and whoever translates falls from grace. Thus, the ethnogenesis of the Jewish people followed a quite extraordinary autoplastic program. Those belonging to the program's people were separated from those who did not belong in a constant process of distinction. The new religion of singularization was anything but a naive folk cult. It was a considered experiment for an ongoing sorting of members and non-members of the covenant. What that meant in real-life terms is revealed by the warning often heard in the Tanakh, specifically in the prophet Isaiah's words, that only a few of those involved at the start would be left. Thus, early Jewish history is so far unique in telling not of a people with a religion, as is usually the case, but of a religion with a people. Theologians who are aware of this slightly unnerving finding like to describe it with the word, quote, chosenness. By this they mean that it is not enough to have one god or another, like all peoples. It is vital to be had by the right God, the unique one. <laughs>